My name is David Rockland, and uh, you are in the uh, workshop A about unlocking business performance and uh, to learn about the tools related to that. Um, I'm also the chairman of AMEC, and I wanted to take a moment in that capacity and really thank our sponsor for our workshop day, Trendiction. Uh, they've really uh, contributed tremendously to this uh, summit, to this conference, and certainly to this day. So how about a big round of applause for Trendiction? Now, uh, to, to help you understand how this works, there's another workshop going on in the next room. And there's a lot of competition between this room and that room. Like those of us who are moderating in this room or participating, we want to make sure we have way more fun in this one than they have over there. So if periodically we may ask you to like just do like a laugh soundtrack, just make a lot of noise so they go, oh, I'm so jealous. I wish I went to workshop A. So. But we're here to talk about more serious things, actually, and I'm joined by uh, two of my colleagues. It's funny, all three of us have been the chair of the IPR Measurement Commission. Mark was first, and then I followed, and Pauline followed me. So you've got people who've been in this uh, field uh, for a while. Mark looks much younger than I do, of course. Um, but, uh, but anyway, we're, we're hoping to share with you a few things um, related to the subject at hand, which is, if this workshop, excuse me, if this summit is all about unlocking business performance through research and measurement and analytics and really unlocking business performance for communications, then really how do you do it? What are the techniques? What are the tools? And so what we're hoping here to do this morning with you is present to you a series of case studies and examples of really what are the tools, what's the state of the art right now, and really, where does this field go from here? So first point I wanted to make is a lot of times we think of analytics and big data and business performance when it comes to communications as something we do here at the very end, right? We, we do it to measure ROI. We do it to measure how do we go forward <clears throat> and improve on the performance of a particular program. And we really focus on that end result as opposed to a recognition that really the tools that we're going to talk about are not only relevant in terms of measuring the back end, if you will, of a communications program, but are really relevant throughout the, the planning process in terms of understanding the market, in terms of understanding the message, in terms of selecting the right channels, et cetera. So my part of this is really to focus on that planning process and to really provide examples uh, to you of, of what that looks like. Uh, and then I'll turn it over to my friend Mark, who will talk about how do you measure performance, what tools are used for that. And then Pauline will talk about something I think is really interesting in terms of, and Mark, yours is interesting too, but um, <laughs> of the intersection of brand and reputation and what are the tools that bring those together. So what I'd like to do is start with one of my absolute positively favorite clients, the Cleveland Clinic, who is actually here, Eileen Scheel, and um, talk how you use analytics from the perspective of understanding the market. So let me tell you a little bit about Cleveland Clinic, or maybe I should ask Eileen, but no, that, okay, don't ask Eileen. Anyway, um, Cleveland Clinic is probably the world's best hospital. If you had to play, go to a place to get fixed up when you had something seriously wrong with you, you're going to want to go to either Cleveland Clinic, and if you can't get in there, you go to Mayo or John Hopkins. But the trouble with Cleveland Clinic, with all due respect, they're not as well known as those two other counterparts. So we engaged with Cleveland Clinic back, I'd like to say about a year or so ago now, to really help them understand and, and to build out what do they say to build out their story and where do they say it. You see, unlike a lot of other companies who really work at getting in the media, Cleveland Clinic, I would argue, doesn't have that problem. Their problem is they got more media than they know what to do with. So the question is, where do you appear? So for example, when Governor Romney and President Obama in their first presidential debate uh, cited Cleveland Clinic as the best example of where healthcare reform in the United States ought to go, I assume, Eileen, you were besieged with opportunity. And the question is, where do you capitalize on that opportunity and what do you say when you have it? If, if your boss is going to appear, Dr. Cosgrove is going to appear on CBS This Morning, for example, what does he talk about? And is CBS This Morning the right channel? So what we did with Cleveland Clinic is an example of using analytics, if you will, and big data to really help make those decisions. What we did 
is began with understanding the patient. Where do these patients come from? What do they come there for? What uh, are their demographics, their age, their income, their gender, et cetera? And then we began to do what sort of big data in many respects is about, which is the layering of different data sets together to really flesh out the understanding of that target in terms of the messages that would motivate them to travel to Cleveland for enhanced medical care, and even more specific in terms of where do you reach them? What are the most important markets? Is Pittsburgh, for example, better than New York? Is Los Angeles better or worse than, let's say, a smaller town in California, like, let's say, San Jose? And so what we did is took psychographic data, as well as media trends data, as well as even down to the zip code data of what people read and how do they acquire information about medical treatment to build, if you will, a set of profiles of who is the real target for destination medical care at the Cleveland Clinic. And the point here that I'm trying to make is when we talk about big data and analytics, this is a really good example of it because it begins often with the client's data about your patients, and then it really reflects the layering on of different data sets to flesh out that profile to help us in communications planning understand when Dr. Cosgrove gets an opportunity to be in the New York Times, is the New York Times really the best outlet or are more people likely, likely to travel from Buffalo, New York or from St. Louis, Missouri to seek treatment and is that the opportunity when President Obama talks about Cleveland Clinic that we really want to take advantage of? So that was a quick example of the idea of using big data and analytics to understand the market understand the message, and understand the positioning, if you will, of an organization. Another example, sticking with healthcare for a minute, is uh, the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. And I wanted to share this example with you as an example of using a tool called market mix modeling, which we'll talk about a little more in depth detail with, with Mark, but using that tool really not so much for ROI measurement, but more so for using it for channel selection. So again, we're trying to decide channel, where do you appear? You have a message, you're gonna promote the organization, where should you be? So Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, how many of you ever heard of it? Okay, quite a few. And one of the ways they raise money for blood cancer research is they have people volunteer to run a half marathon and they raise money, those people who are volunteering, they raise money from their friends to participate in the marathon. Now, they have different channels by which they promote the opportunity to do this volunteerism. They have direct mail, radio advertising, online earned media, and POP, which refers to point of purchase. In other words, something if you went to a sports authority or a sports store, they'd have something in the store of here's how to sign up to help raise money, in this case, for blood cancer research. So their question was, we don't know which of these work best. In other words, we want to understand where to put our dollars. We're a small nonprofit organization. We don't have a lot of money for measurement and research. And we want to understand, however, where do we invest across these different channels? So we use the technique, it's called regression analysis, which is in great detail down here at the bottom. But fundamentally what it did was to look at 56 markets across the United States and look at how much they spent across those four different channels in those markets, and in turn, how many people wound up volunteering to participate in the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society events. And what we found was kind of interesting. What you're seeing here is a result, which helps them then pick their channels. In the case of direct mail, in other words, mailing things to people's houses, they were spending the most money. But in terms of return per thousand dollars, they were only getting seven leads or seven people signing up for their races for every thousand dollars they spent. Radio advertising was, again, second largest, but had actually the worst results. And then down here at the bottom, it found, they found that by participating and engaging online, for every thousand dollars spent there, the return was way higher. And point of purchase, in fact, was also quite strong. And so what this helped them do was really make a choice. Uh, you know what, as we look at where we invest our dollars going forward, when we look at where do we want our messages to appear, we really want to focus on the two here on the bottom more so than we want to focus on the two on the top. 
And what was interesting, sort of as a further example of that, excuse me, is that within point of purchase, they had two ways of doing it. One way is they just send stuff to these sports stores and say, hey, would you put this stuff out for me, okay? We call that P-O-P-H, or hodgepodge. That's a very scientific term we often use in research. Hodgepodge, haphazard, something with an H. And <coughs> the second was they hired professionals to go to the stores and set up end cap displays. And, and really, you know, it's more expensive, but it looks and, and is, in fact, uh, more effective. And they said, you know what? Tell us, we currently spend $227,000 on the hodgepodge approach. Does it make sense to shift it to the professional approach, or should we shift the other way? And what we did in this analysis, in a little more detail than what I showed you on the page before, was to be able to demonstrate to them that, you know what, get out of the hodgepodge approach. It's cheaper, but it doesn't really do very much for you. Instead, hire professionals, and if you do that, you'll pick up in this case, we could predict for them roughly 3,000 more people would wind up and did wind up signing up for their races. Now, everyone who raises money for Cleveland, excuse me, Cleveland Clinic, I'm stuck with you, Eileen, um, for the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, they raise about $3,000 each. This analysis alone, just this part of it, if they move this money, they pick up 3,000 new leads. Put that all together, it's roughly $300,000 new money. The question is, if you were the head of the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, well, so what did this study, this brilliant study, cost me? If I'm going to make $300,000 more, what did it cost me to figure that out? This study cost about $15,000, and it was entirely based on the data the client already had. They knew how many people they signed up in their 56 markets. They knew how much they spent in every one of those markets over time. It was really just applying an analytical tool that we're talking about here in Workshop A really called market mix modeling or regression analysis to understand when you vary those different channels, what happens in terms of the number of people who show up. So my final example in terms of um, using analytics for really communications planning is to do it in terms of message selection. So, so far I've talked about two very good healthcare examples. You go to Cleveland Clinic to get healthier. You give money to the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society to benefit blood research. Now I'm going to use a client example of how to get actually into Cleveland Clinic, assuming you didn't want to, which is a liquor client. Now this liquor client basically wanted to know, um, we currently do advertising and we currently do earn media. We want to understand what drives our purchase funnel. So this is a technique, it's called discrete choice analysis. And what the type of analysis does is to basically predict what does it take, what messages trigger the different elements of purchase. And when I refer to the different elements of purchase, before I can get you to buy this particular liquor, I have to make you aware it actually exists. You have to have heard of it. I have to make sure you'll, you know, you, you'd consider it, that you like it, that you find it appealing, that you would conceivably buy it, and ultimately, would you actually recommend it to someone else? So basically what we did is we fielded, this was in Australia, it was about six months ago, and we fielded a fairly large scale, just standard brand equity tracking survey, just like you've seen it for lots of different products. But here what we did is we took the analysis up a notch to basically say, okay, if I want to move you into recommendation, what are the things I got to focus on to move you to recommend the product or to consume it? And the stuff in the middle are basically the things that no matter where you are in purchase consideration, actual purchase, or recommendation, those three things are the most important. At the end of the day, if you can focus on those three things in your advertising and or your PR, that's what's going to drive performance, unlocking business performance for this particular brand of liqueur. And what we could do in the analysis is then say, okay, let's look at the ads that just ran in Australia and look at consumer reaction to the ads. And basically the green line is telling you what was the numbers for different traits of the product after ad exposure. The blue line is before ad exposure. So what you, we did is not only identify, just stepping back, these things in the middle that are really important, 
as well as the items around the edge, which are also important, but for different parts of purchase, but could then look and say, okay, are the ads that are running, in fact, driving home the messages that in turn trigger purchase or trigger recommendation or move someone toward consideration? And we could do that both for taste and functional attributes, as well as some of the emotional attributes that are affiliated with this particular product. And, and found, frankly, that the ads that we were running at that time in Australia, they're going to run in other parts of the world through this year, were working in many of the cases, but there were a couple of those aspects that really weren't coming through. So this really became a diagnostic, if you will, to not only be able to say, okay, are the ads working in general, but how do we tweak the ads to bring out those messages that were right at the core of understanding what drives purchase, purchase consideration, uh, recommendation, et cetera. So I've tried to give you a quick flavor in terms of the communications planning process of what tools come out of the world of analytics that are helpful in terms of understanding the market, understanding the channel, and in this final case, understanding really what should your message be and how well is it working? Where do you need to dial up or in some cases dial down? And now I'd like to turn this over to my good friend Mark Wiener, colleague. We worked together for a while at Ketchum as well. Uh, he taught me everything I knew about becoming IPR chairman a ways back. And uh, he's really going to turn it over and start talking more about how do you use analytics to, to measure performance and, in fact, improve performance. So, Mark? Well, thanks, David, and thanks, everybody. Uh, it's my first conference, and it's uh, a great honor to be selected as a speaker my first time out. Uh, how many of you in the room have businesses that focus on media analysis? Or just a quick show? Okay, so many. Um, because my position here to, in, in presenting is to represent and advocate media analysis in this process of unlocking business performance. Um, in the conversations that I have and in, the, uh, and, and in conferences like this, I, I'm witnessing the debate between outputs and outcomes. And I'm sure you're all hearing this too. About the, uh, and, and what I see are many people who are, in my opinion, overemphasizing the importance of outcomes in this combination of outputs and outcomes. And what I would suggest to you is that both are equally important and that, to paraphrase Sun Tzu, the philosopher general, um, in my opinion and in my experience, outcomes without puts are the slowest path to victory, and out, um, sorry, outcomes without outputs is the slowest path, and outputs without outcomes is the noise before defeat. And what I mean by that is that outcomes help us understand the effects that we're having on a target audience, but outputs are the way that we manage to achieve those outcomes. Those are the, the levers that we pull and push. And I understand that public relations is more than just uh, media relations, but the focus I'm going to have today is on uh, media analysis and its effects on business performance in a time of big data. What I would suggest to you is that we're in a time where we're, um, we're experiencing what I call the third wave of media analysis. The first wave might have begun in 1964 or so when um, content analysis involved people coding content for the presence of messages and tone, that sort of thing, which was great. It's still common, but it's challenged in a time of big data because it is relatively slow, even though it's often more accurate. And in a time with so much data flowing through, um, through the practice, it just takes too much time to manually analyze um, when we need to just uh, to capture content, to sift it, to filter it, to analyze it, and then to visualize it in the huge amounts that are required through big data. The second wave, uh, and this is maybe five years ago, was a shift representing a shift that was responding to social media and the cascades of data that were coming through, cascades of content, where um, fully automated systems could process very quickly, but often 
who are handicapped by inaccuracies and irrelevant content. So the data processed consistently and quickly, but it was often uh, not very helpful in making big business decisions. And what I would suggest to you now is that we're in a third wave, which is a hybrid uh, involving both the consistency and speed of automation, but in balance, in the right kind of harmony with human validation and human analysis, which is a way to drive the kinds of important decisions that are now being derived through big data, big business decisions, not just better public relations or communications performance, but big business decisions that can affect the uh, success of the enterprise. It seems like big data, has, uh, there's another session, a parallel session about big data, so I don't want to confuse you that I'm in the wrong place. But it's become uh, so common, this phrase, that it's almost, in my uh, feeling, is almost like a cliche. Everybody's talking about big data. It's not confined to public relations by any means. And what we mean by big data, I think, is, is uh, all of these streams, the, the incredible volume of content that's, and, and data that are coming from transactions, from uh, research, from all these data sources that have to come together and make sense in some way so that a business can benefit from the, the data that's available to them. But in my experience, big data tells companies what happened. It talks about transactions taking place in a certain time in a certain place. Uh, it doesn't necessarily provide context as to why that's happening. And I think media analysis provides uh, a suitable counterpart to big data to provide those answers. Uh, so um, in my experience with market mix modeling, we're incorporated into those statistical models are purchased data like through supermarket scanner data, um, also advertising and other forms of marketing uh, outputs that are factored into the analysis. But um, survey research typically doesn't happen frequently enough to help explain these models and why somebody's, uh, why something is happening at a given time in a given place. Media analysis, and especially now with social media and real-time analytics, provides a lot more context for these models to understand what's happening in that place at that time. It could be that sales went up for something that was totally unrelated to marketing investment decisions. So for example, in experiences I've had with, with movie ticket sales, the biggest driver of movie ticket sales is not the advertising or the, uh, it's, it's the weather. So if, and it's also a big factor with, with uh, beer sales. When it's hot, people buy beer. When it's raining, people go to the movies. So big data can't always explain that. And media analysis very often can represent something else that's happening in that marketplace at that time. Sometimes has nothing to do with marketing communication. The potential we have for PR in the time and media analysis in the time of big data is in a way no different than it's been. It's to uncover opportunities. But the opportunities that we're trying to uncover and to uh, optimize are, in my opinion, bigger decisions than just what's happening in public relations. It affects the performance of the business. And I would suggest to you that there's two paths to unlocking this value. One is direct experience where uh, public relations happens and it has an effect in the absence of any other possibility that only public relations is communicating at that time in that place and something happens as a result of it. And the second is what I refer to as derived. It's, a, it's something similar to market mix modeling where there is a lot of things that are happening simultaneously and only through statistical analysis and modeling can we deconstruct those elements, try to make sense of it and make them actionable. And what I have for you is a, a video example. It starts right away. This is a story about MasterCard.
So while MasterCard has probably more transaction data than any organization in the world, right? every time we swipe a card, there's transaction data, there's a data trail. Uh, they're doing really interesting things with being able to combine lots of sources of data and interacting that, these data streams to make better business decisions. But through that big wall that they call it, uh, which is in a, in a, in a four-story atrium, it's a giant wall, you could get a feel for it. Uh, they're using that wall to engage employees, but also engage with their clients, card issuers, banks, merchants, to make better business decisions. So while they're doing all this modeling, there are two examples I want to share with you of how they use that big wall uh, to make a better business decision on behalf of the company and their clients, just from what they could visualize from traditional and social media visualization, as I shared with you. One was a case where uh, a hotel chain, uh, international hotel chain, who's loyal to MasterCard's competitor, Visa. And every year, this hotel marketing team is invited to headquarters at MasterCard to talk about switching their affinity card from Visa to MasterCard. Every year they come, they're very polite, and they decline the offer and stay with what they're doing. In this case, the me in this meeting and in every other meeting with customers, uh, the meeting is conducted in front of that wall. The, the, I don't know if you notice, there's conversation areas, there's a coffee bar there. They've made a real big show of this wall. And in this meeting, the chief marketing officer from the hotel chain and uh, his team were present, the MasterCard team was present. And at the end of the meeting, it was almost predictable. They said, well, you know, this is really great. We love uh, what you've shown us, but we're going to stick with Visa uh, because our customers love the card uh, and they love Visa. They said, and so MasterCard countered with, well, that's, you know, that's really great. Let's take a look at what your customers are really saying. And so through that wall, they just put in some uh, search parameters and called up all of the uh, social media commentary about that hotel chain and its card. And all they could see was this card sucks, I hate this card, I'm not, I'm not going to stay at this hotel again because the card is so bad. So in a meeting like that, high powered meeting, there was maybe 90 seconds of silence, which is a, a long time if you think about a setting like that, after which the hotel chain CMO said, I think you're right, I think we need to reconsider. Uh, one month later they switched. And the impact on MasterCard was a multi-million dollar decision that that hotel chain uh, made in switching their affinity. No other factors were involved except they saw for themselves, visualized on this big wall, what their own customers were saying in a way that they didn't know without MasterCard sharing that intelligence with them. It's a very powerful example and one that has a meaningful impact on the business and no other way to explain it except that it was happening through social media and, uh, and through public relations. The se second example is one that um, is another business performance enhancing activity that was driven by social media monitoring through that wall and um, in an untraditional application for business performance. Uh, through the social media, um, uh, MasterCard was tracking the impact of its launch of a new service called mobile payments, or uh, where you, know, you can show your phone at a restaurant and that acts as a credit card and it processes a transaction. Well, through the research that we conducted using the social media, we found that there were certain patterns of adoption and preference among users, people who already had adopted this new technology and were using it, and those who hadn't yet adopted it but were excited about trying it. And what we found is that there were real, uh, there was more optimism among people who had not yet tried it, and the people who had been using this technology encountered problems in certain situations. Through, so through a, a deeper analysis, we identified what the problems were being voiced through these people who cared enough to talk about it through social media channels. Uh, and w what those problems were and where they encountered these problems about uh, acceptance among merchants and uh, understanding among merchants that, uh, you know, how to use this technology. Uh, they had concerns about security and whether people could steal financial information through, from their phone. So as a result of this, MasterCard uh, uh, revised the product strategy 
and use this data from their consumers and potential consumers to refine the product. So that, that for, I've been doing this for a long time. I've, I have no experience prior to this where public relations was driving product development. And that's exactly what happened here. So uh, the, the feedback that came through the social media channels that were that these were the issues, security and acceptance, and their, 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 uh, the sources of this, these concerns were fast food restaurants and taxi cab drivers who, who accept credit cards but didn't know how to accept these credit cards. So uh, the product was refined, it was repositioned, and each of these target markets was, um, had slightly different positioning and education programs to enhance uh, acceptance and to reinforce the positive aspects of the card. Uh, next example before I turn it over Dave, for, to David for more detailed uh, explanation of market mix modeling and how it works. <clears throat> this is a case, actually, uh, Pauline may be reinforcing too, where uh, combining survey research with media analysis revealed certain elements of uh, what's working best and what's working not so well in an integrated marketing strategy for an organization in the U.S. called Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, or CMS. Uh, every year in the U.S., uh, government uh, health care services are made available to seniors um, who have to make a decision about which plan they choose to make. Uh, there's a lot of confusion, there's a lot of competing messaging from insurance companies, from the government, from lots of other interested parties, and so it can be a confusing choice. As a result, most people choose to do nothing, and as a result, aren't um, gaining the benefits through this program. Uh, in this case, we did pre and post uh, surveys and media analysis and, of, uh, and looked at, through the surveys, the uh, awareness and understanding of earned media as well as paid. And what we found in the end was that um, only in those cases where people remembered and understood both the public relations messaging as well as the other forms of marketing uh, were the, the biggest gains to be generated. And in this case, uh, those who remembered both were 230% more likely to make a choice, which was the desired behavior, than those people who had seen and understood the advertising only. So it was, in a way, because it was such a much smaller cost of public relations, uh, it was almost like public relations acted as an insurance policy. It, it optimized the much heavier investment in advertising uh, and showed that in a slightly incremental investment, the advertising could be that much more powerful and the results that much greater. And year after year, we're seeing gains, in this case, uh, over, two year gain, uh, over these two years, uh, those results improved 11% year over year. And then, um, just in my, in my experience, this is uh, a slide I've used because I have permission to use it from Miller Brewing Company. It's an older project, but it was one of the first cases of market mix modeling incorporating PR data. And while we're, we're talking about market mix modeling, I have to say that in most cases, uh, in practically every case, public relations does not initiate the modeling. It usually comes from another area within the company, typically those areas with the greatest levels of expenditure, which usually means advertising and other forms of marketing, usually uh, we have to do better than that, uh, according to David. Um, anyway, um, usually advertising and uh, direct marketing and price promotions end up costing the most to an organization. Um, and th that's usually where market mix modeling comes from, trying to optimize those three elements. And then the modelers are interested in understanding what else could help to refine the model. In most cases, uh, a third of all transactions or more, 30, 50 percent of all transactions, cannot be explained by any form of marketing in any case. That people just buy the product because they love it, for example. In this case, uh, we were able to look at the impact, relative impact of trade promotions, television, mass market television advertising, and public relations. Uh, what you see in the red line is the percentage of spending, and blue is the, the uh, incremental revenue generated by those investments. In this case, public relations, and in most cases, represents less than one half of 1% of the investment. In other words, it rounds down to zero in most of these 
cases for mass market um, uh, consumer products. Uh, but the, the most revealing bar is this gray bar, which shows the relationship between expenditure and sales that could be attributed to that marketing element. And what we saw, and we see this pretty consistently, is that trade promotions deliver roughly $2 on the dollar. Television advertising, which is roughly 70%, 60 some yeah, 70 percent 80 percent of all uh, the spending uh, generates only maybe a dollar ten on the dollar so very low return and public relations in this case delivered eight dollars on the dollar so I've seen cases where PR delivers three dollars on the dollar I've also seen cases where PR delivers forty three dollars on the dollar so it's always the most efficient element in the market mix model just because it, the, the level of expenditure is so low uh, and the and the life of a public relations program is so much longer than an advertising program that it delivers these great returns on investment. So um, with that, I'm going to turn it back to David to talk more detail about what market mix modeling is and uh, provide another great example. Thanks. So. Uh, I also want to thank Mark for that video because if you were in Workshop B in that video, I'm sure you couldn't hear anything in Workshop B when that video was on. So there, just imagine, they're all in there going, wow, I really wish I was in the other room. There's so much more fun. Um, also, I want to thank you, you know, when you mentioned about the beer in the movie theater, you know, if this measurement thing doesn't work out for us, you know, if we start a business like movie theaters that sold beer, I mean, how hard could this be, right? Rain, sun, it wouldn't matter. This is a slide, actually, I borrowed from my friend back here, Reiner Lang, who's with uh, Catch and Pleon in, in Bonn, Germany, that just ex sort of gets at what is market mix modeling, because we talk about it a lot, but then the question is, so what is it exactly? And it's basically the idea, and Mark just alluded to it and, and sort of described it pretty well, I thought, in terms of we have lots of different channels we use to communicate. Okay, which of those draw, give you the biggest bang for the buck? Which ones give you the most sales or profit? And how does that compare to what those channels cost? And that's the fundamentals behind market mix model. It's basically done with some form of regression analysis. And if you don't use these terms every day, a regression analysis basically is an intent to explain what causes something to happen, not what correlates to it, but in fact, what causes sales or what causes profit or causes people to sign up for the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society or buy Miller Beer as examples. So this is an example of an output from a market mix model, okay? And what this is, is the line, the whole line together, is sales of a product over about an 18 month period. Now this particular product is a frozen food entree called healthy choice. It's one that you tend to buy when you are trying to be healthy or potentially lose a little weight. So you'll notice that sales absolutely plummet twice, very close together. Any idea what that sales plummet is related to, Wendy? Christmas and Thanksgiving. Nobody, this is the United States, nobody eats healthy choice food products at Christmas and Thanksgiving, okay? Then they get real upset, so they make a New Year's resolution. <laughs> then they discover they don't fit in their clothes for bathing suit season anymore, so they really buy a lot of it then. And this is actually true. This is their real sales. So what a market mix model does is go back through time and look at, OK, how did sales change? What were some of those external factors, like Mark pointed out, the weather? is certainly an external factor. So is bikini season is an external factor. So is Thanksgiving and Christmas. But then how do the different channels contribute to sales and its variation? Because what regression analysis fundamentally is, is you watch something vary over time. You say, okay, what's making that change happen? And how much of that change is attributable to lots of different things? You'll notice on this chart something Mark alluded to as well. This big blue stuff at the bottom, well, you go, wow, that's a pretty big contributor. That's called base. And what base refers to is, you know what? 
no matter how much marketing you did for Healthy Choice Foods, you'd still sell some. Okay? It's often thought of also as brand equity. In other words, if all marketing went away, people still have heard of your brand, people still will buy it. And so that's the stuff at the bottom. That's the stuff that these models don't explain particularly well. This red stuff or maroon stuff, you go, okay, well, that's really big. What, what would that be? That's called trade merchandising. Trade merchandising is the practice of buying shelf space in retail markets. So what do you know? When Healthy Choice or ConAgra Foods, its owner, buys more space in supermarkets, they sell more of their product. Now, these little colors all up in here are different types of advertising and different types of public relations. And you could go, oh, wait a minute. Those are all so tiny, why should we spend any money on them at all? Let's put it all here in trade merchandising because look how big trade merchandising is. And Mark made the right point. The point is, it doesn't matter how big or small they are, is what did it cost you to do these and how does that compare with how much sales you got? So in this model in particular, we found that certain aspects of PR were quite effective and frankly certain aspects weren't quite as effective, at least directly. We also found that certain types of advertising work. And when I say work, what work really refers to in this modeling is, is it worth the money? Because they all kind of work to some degree, usually. It's just whether how much you spend on it. Just because trade merchandising is real big, if you spent way more than it's worth, would it be worth it to you? No, it wouldn't be worth it to you. So this is what a market mix model does. Now, this is basically having run the model and then attributed sales going backwards. Models are also used, just like I showed you with the, the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, to predict going forward. If we know how each of these contributes moving ahead, we then know how to move investments around to, in fact, make this happen. We'd also know something very, very specific, which is, you know what? Don't spend a whole lot of money during Christmas and, and Thanksgiving. It's just not, nothing's going to happen. Forget it. It just doesn't work. So these kind of models are predictive as well as, frankly, retrospective. The other thing that was interesting in this particular case study is when we ran it, a big chunk of the PR activity was Twitter, okay? Something called Twitter parties, which I don't quite understand what they are, but apparently a lot of people get on Twitter and they have a party. So, and it somehow does good things. When we first ran this, we ran it for Twitter party activity and discovered there was no effect. What no effect means in a market mix model is that the coefficient related to that activity is statistically insignificant. When a client will say, I can't get a read on my public relations activity in my market mix model, what they're really referring to is, it isn't that it isn't effective, it's just not statistically being teased out of the model. So often a fix for that, which is what the fix was here, say, okay, let's look at a secondary effect. A secondary effect refers to when one channel benefits the other. So in this case, Twitter activity drove people to a website. On the website, they downloaded coupons. Website visits had a whole heck of a lot to do with sales. So in a model like this, you're not only measuring the direct effect, in other words, Twitter to sales, but you're also measuring indirect or interactive effects where one affects the other affects the other. A lot of times in these models, what you find is that PR and advertising, when taken separately, are each less effective in the model than when you put them together. In other words, they interact or validate each other and in turn, it is a one plus one winds up being more like a three going forward. So I tried to give you here a quick flavor of market mix modeling. And now what I want to do is turn it over to Pauline Draper Watts. Um, one of the interesting sort of, uh, I guess, trends in the measurement world is we've often thought of brand and reputation as two completely different things. A lot of work these days is how do you put these things together, and in fact, the discovery, they're often very related to each other. So with that, let's have a big hand for Pauline. Thank you, David, and thank you, Mark. I have to say, I feel quite honored to be presenting with both of you guys as well. And 
this is really a great opportunity to be here. I think that what, just picking up on what David's just said about the marketing mix modeling, for many years, I was forever throwing PR data into these big models and sending it through. And it was always really difficult to show the shift and the contribution of PR because advertising was always looking so much bigger, the other metrics were. And it was by often getting at those secondary effects that you could actually see the contribution that PR was playing in a way that you couldn't see when you're looking at the big picture and looking at just the raw data. The other thing before I start I wanted to just draw out was the fact that we've talked a lot about different set data sets and big data but what you'll notice is that frequently it's come from other areas and so often we feel we have to be the owners of things whereas if we manage to break down some of these silos what happens is we have access to all this other data that we can pull together that actually helps to inform what we actually do and what we plan but anyway i want to talk about the brand brand and reputation and I think today's world presents many new challenges for us in business. We've got shifting global economies. We've got ready access to more data, increased availability of information, and ease of accessing communications. And what this means is that our world has changed dramatically. If you think back even five years ago, if you think back 10 years ago, more so, and et cetera. And the distance between business behavior and stakeholder expectation is more easily identified than ever before. So what I've got is a few examples here from the social media world, where by monitoring it and seeing what's going on, you can actually see what happens and the cause on people's expectation. These are three faux pas that happened in, the recent, in recent years. The first one was from the Red Cross, where someone accidentally tweeted thinking they were tweeting on their personal account instead of which they were tweeting on the Red Cross account. And so what they did was it, it sort of went round quite a lot. And in this instance, they managed to, train, to actually transform it to their advantage. They did various things. They were very transparent about it. They posted on their blog to say that it had happened. They removed the tweet and then they put a tweet up with a bit of humour, which read, and I've just got to find it here, um, we, we deleted the rogue tweet, but rest assured, the Red Cross is sober and we've confiscated the keys. So, so they actually use it. And then Doghead, Dogfish Beer, they actually went and put a tweet as well, because it all went round at the time, this tweet that had happened, um, encouraging their fans to donate to the Red Cross. So what was started off as a reputation nightmare, they actually managed to transfer, transform by being transparent, by monitoring it, by taking the tweet down and adding some humour in. And then, as I say, they, it actually landed up raising funds for them. The second story, if you have followed the news today of Chrysler and what they're doing at present against the, gov the US government in terms of not replacing the, um, not, not actually um, implementing some safety issues. In this case, um, Chrysler Autos, they actually had a um, marketing company that ran this blog for them. And again, the person went and posted there thinking they were posting to their personal account it actually cost them their job um, because it says, I found it ironic that Detroit is known for the as Motor City and yet no one here knows how to effing drive. Um, and not a very career, um, rather, rather a career limiting post, particularly when you're doing it to your client. The third one, more recent with Superstorm Sandy. This is just an example of Gap, but there were various others, American Apparel. They saw it as a marketing opportunity and they got a lot of pushback because amidst the tragedy, people did not want to be sold to. Um, and so that's another example. And I've, I've really used these in terms of thinking of brand and reputation to show that it's important to follow what's going on in the brand, not only in terms of what's being put out, but what's being received and how people are actually responding to what you're saying. I want to take a few moments to talk about the Edelman Trust Barometer. Who's familiar with it? Oh, quite a few people are. 
excellent. Um, I have the privilege of the access to masses of data. We go back 13 years of data um, for the Trust Barometer. And I think that as a study, it tells us lots of insights in terms of reputation for companies. Um, I think there's a new dynamic mandate um, that business looks at corporate reputation through a behavioural lens more now than just looking at those traditional metrics of finance and product and brand. So what we're doing with the Trust Barometer is we're actually gleaning those opinions and we're looking at 26 markets now. We do it from the general population and informed publics. We interview over 31,000 people worldwide. It's 1,000 people in each market for the general population and either 500 or 200, depending by market, in informed publics. And just to give you a couple of headlines, headlines from this year, we found that there's a real crisis in leadership. Business this year, 35% of the markets this year actually said that for business, their trust scores were greater than 50%, which is an improvement on the last few years. So trust in business is increasing and going back to the levels it was several years ago. In terms of media, because we're also involved in the media here, um, for the first time, trust in media was over 50% in the majority of markets. So when we're taking this barometer, when we're doing the trust barometer, we're looking at government, we're looking at business, we're looking at not-for-profits, and we're looking for media. And we're taking people's perceptions of all of those. So that's why it's encouraging to see that media that really did take quite a nosedive is now back on the ascendancy. And when we actually look at it, because we've got so many markets, we can actually slice and dice the data lots of different ways. Um, one of the ways we look at it is from the developed markets and the emerging markets. And we can find in the developed markets that traditional media is still the number one source, followed by search, hybrid, owned, and then social. Whereas when we go to the emerging markets, we find that it's search, traditional, and then social appears much more prominently than it does in the traditional markets. And we also find in the emerging markets, media is considered much more important than those traditional markets. So if I was to look at some of the data from it, this is why trust is important. A good reputation does not necessarily equate to trust in a company. You can actually have great financial figures, you can have good products, they can like you. That does not equate to trust. Trust is when you behave in certain ways and you, put and you actually tap into people's emotions and cause them to support your company and what it is that you're doing. So in this instance, we've actually looked at a company, when a company is distrusted versus when a company is trusted. And what we can see here is that when a company is distrusted, then 57% then believe negative information more readily, and only 15% believe positive when they've heard it one or two times. So when a company is distrusted, people absolutely gravitate to the negative the negative in terms of that distrust and it's harder to actually promote the positive. Whereas, when we come this side of the, of the chart, when a company is trusted, then 51% believe the positive. So it's a much easier sell or, you know, to actually believe incredible for people when they trust you to believe what you're saying. Whereas if you say negative, 25% have got to hear it one or two times to actually believe it. So I think that really reinforces the fact that it's important to make sure that we're building that depository of trust. I mentioned this year that there's a real gap between trust in business and trust in leadership to do the right thing. So here are a few of the countries and markets that we were looking at globally. Um, trust in business was at 50%, but trust in leadership leaders to do the right thing was only 18%. Um, in China, which is one of the trusted markets, um, it's 67 to 32. So there's that 35 percentage point gap between trust in the business and in the leadership. India, 68% to 34 
US 50 to, to 15. So that's a 35% gap. Germany, I thought we'd throw some, we're in Europe, so I thought we'd do Germany, France, and Spain. So you'll find here that in Germany, the trust in business is lower than some of those other markets. It's at 42%, but trust in leadership is down at 13%. And then France, 37 to 10%, and Spain, the trust in business is at 38%. And the leadership, it, trust in leadership to actually do the right thing um, is down at 17%. So I think if you think about some of the situations, and we talked about always contextualizing, if you think about some of the world events, some of the events that have happened in these countries, you can understand that there is that credibility gap that needs to be made up. Um, we tend to find that banking and finance is often one of the least trusted, whereas technology is one of the most trusted industries. So it's all a question of trying to pull it all together and contextualizing it. When we're looking at trust, we've got 16 attributes. Now, some of these relate to brand. I often think of corporate reputation and brand as two sides of the same coin. They, they sit together. And if your reputation's doing well, your brand's generally doing well. And if your brand's doing well, your corporate reputation's doing well. And if one's going badly, it affects, they affect each other. They'll pull each other down. So we're looking here at 16 attributes that we've really put into five clusters and I think this also shows how industry has changed so much because there was a time where for corporate reputation we would have focused on the operations, the financial performance the, and the products, those sort of things that are really important whereas now what we're finding is the engagement with, you, with your customer base and your stakeholders, integrity of the company feature much more highly in terms of trust and thus reputation. So the importance has changed totally. In fact, products and services, when we look at measuring the expectation versus performance gap in terms of expectation, products and services is still number one. But after that, it goes to listening to customer needs and feedback. Um, and then the actual um, integrity integrity aspects and people are much more interested now in what how you behave as a company not just what you do this leads to a change in the pyramid of influence it always used to be top down ceo board of directors academics and we would then just have that chain of influence whereas now it's become more of a diamond and we've got an inverted diamond at the bottom where our employees talk to each other. There are these peer-to-peer -peer relationships that are going on that we find that there are activists and other people we're needing to engage in. And trust in the media has gone up. There's that the advent of the social media and people interacting together. So we're no longer able to just look at it as a pyramid, but it has to be an inverted when we're looking at the corporate reputation. It's gone from the few to the many, from a monologue of telling people to a dialogue that's going on from control to empowerment and therefore it's important that when we're doing those things that we're looking at these sort of metrics to see how we're performing. So case study number one, it's a food and beverage company and they wanted to reposition themselves. They wanted to position themselves from um, a soda company to a global food and beverage company that offered consumers a wide array of choices. And so you can see they, went for, they wanted to go from the soda to the diversified foods. Now, this looks a bit much, but it's a dashboard. <laughs> that I'm going to endeavor to, I'm just going to pull out a few things from it to, to show you what we're actually looking at here. What we did was we actually were doing a survey of elites. We were looking at the client, year-on-year um, -year comparisons, and looking at how they stacked up with various companies. So one of those, it happens to be the client, and the others were competitors or other companies that they aspired to be like. And what we're doing is we were seeing how each of those companies, in this case our company, has improved year on year in terms of its reputation and leaps. We then wanted to look at it by market. Barry, you're making all kinds of hand signals. I think that's <laughs> Sorry, Barry. That's okay. <laughs> so... It's just easier to explain it here. <laughs> so here what we've got is looking at the breakdown in different markets. 
because it's a global company. You can't just look at one market. So we can see how strong in China, but they actually went down at year on year. But we look at Brazil and India, and that we've got the global position where they went up. But we can just see how they've all how it's changed. This helps a company to actually be able to work out what they need to do, what they're doing right, because they know what they've been doing in company in countries, they know the situations there, and see what it is that's driving by looking under the hood of that to see what is driving those changes in metrics. Over here, we have got the leaks in the brands. We're actually looking at the brands and seeing the shift in awareness. So we're doing an awareness as well as an, a reputation. We're looking at media coverage for various different pillars. So we've got the media coverage here and what's contributing to it and the overall sentiment year on year. We've got the purpose expectation gap. So this is looking at the expectation for the company versus the reality. And then we've got some other metrics down there. So what we're doing is taking a year-on-year -year snapshot of the company from its corporate reputation and how it's affecting the brand to be able to see how year-on-year, -year, over a period of time, it's managing to transition from being that soda company to a global food and beverage company. In order to do that, we also had to look at the association of different brands with the company. So we can see here that we have got, over time, looking at the reputation, the association of brands. So when we're looking at just one brand, there's not a very great association. Two brands, three to five brands, it's starting to improve, and six plus brands. So you can see the more, br the more brands that people can associate with that company, the better that plays into its reputation. When we're looking at it here, we're now looking at attributes. So we've got like the high quality products, innovator, healthy is somewhere along there as well. And we're looking at when that's communicated through one brand, through three brands, and through six plus brands. And what we can see is like when it's at three brands, most of them are well over, uh, are over most of the measures are 50% or higher. So that seems to be quite a good spot for them to be in. But clearly, the more brands, the more it goes up. But that includes that costs more money and is, is more involved in marketing and other activities. So it's looking at where to actually place the money. And then we're looking here at the sub-brands and building globally, looking at the association with the company and how those all play in. Case study number two. This is an engineering company. And it's a model that we were looking at in order to be able to establish more about what the company represented and how to take it forward. So in this, we've plotted against each other the perception versus the functional. So here, you'll see the, measure, the example measures are the same, but we're looking at what people think about it. So that's looking very much at the perception versus the actual performance, how they're delivering on that. So that's looking at those two measures, whereas the other two, we're looking at the reputation versus operational. So the operational are the things you'd expect, like revenue, performance, profit margin, share price, all, the, all those tangibles, as it were. And then when we look at the reputation, what we've got here is the va brand value valuation, the net promoter score. I use that with several of my clients. And what we find is, for are people familiar with the net promoter score, an NPS? Okay, it's where you're asking a question and you've got the people that are promoters that are the top performers and the detractors that are the bottom performers and you take away one from the other and then you're going to get the net promoter score. So it's, it's a good indication of, it's not necessarily all it was originally designed to be, but it's a great education of what uh, indication of the score of how someone perceives the company to be. So here we've got the reputation drivers, employee satisfaction, and we're looking at that to really provide a whole matrix. Now, not all of these necessarily sit within the realm of public relations. I think one of the things that we, you've heard from us consistently is the fact that it can pull data from elsewhere. So we can look at it holistically, and I hope that if that's one thing you take away from today, is looking at things holistically and breaking down the silos to actually partner with other areas of organizations where you can. Third 
is my beloved client Starbucks. Um, I've actually cut down some of these charts, but we actually do some primary survey research for them, we do media analysis for them, we blend the two regularly so that we're able to look at the brand and the reputation of the company, how effective their initiatives are, not only from a point of view of the messages resonating in the media, but also people's recall on it. So what I'm looking at here is just a few of their values that we look at. So we've got the factors that influence brand perception, and I've just pulled out five of them. There's a whole string of them that we look at. Um, but value, as you can imagine, coffee credibility, you know, if you're Starbucks, coffee credibility is pretty important um, in terms of driving business. Um, customer experience, again, important. And then we've got the factors influencing brand, brand recommendation. And you'll see they're very similar, but it's just based on a different question that we're asking to get to those metrics that we pull out once a quarter for them. And one of the things that is great about it, it's a bit like when David gave that Conagra example and you had Thanksgiving and you had the dip at Christmas, is when you start building data up from over a year, no matter whether it's big or small data, then you can start seeing what the trends are. And you know then that, right, like, I know that Q1 is going to potentially be a dip because it's after all the holiday that's happened. And you, you know then what to expect and how to best realign the dollars of your spend. Message penetration versus customer recall. This is an example whereby we're actually blending the data. So we're blending the, the actual message penetration, so the messages that are being communicated, and again, I've just pulled out five of the messages, versus the recall. And we know from experience of looking at this over time, what we expect in terms of the ratio between the message penetration and recall, depending on what it is. Because some things are going to resonate much better and you're going to get a stronger recall, whereas other things are going to be, you're going to spend an awful lot of time communicating that message and it may get very low recall because it hasn't got that same resonance. And then finally, we've got the impact of initiatives on brand favorability. So here, we are looking at quarter on quarter the various initiatives that they're doing and seeing how that affects the brand. So have people heard about it? And then how does that affect the brand? And again, we've got years of data, so we can actually go back several years for it. And they use this to help inform their strategy. I think that one of the things we've looked at and we've all talked about is the fact that like to this mic, is the fact that by utilizing the data, it's not just to look back, but it should always be to look forward as well, to inform what we're doing. So finally, on this, just in conclusion, I'm really hoping that you've grasped the fact that reputation and brand are intrinsically linked. You can't separate the two. They overlap all over the place, and whilst the reputation is very much looking at the perception of the company, the brand is of, of the brand, you need to, the two need to sit very closely together. And the same works in, so you've got both from the case study, so they work either side, alongside each other. And then also that research can explore an interplay between, uh, the research can explore an interplay between the two of brand and reputation and pull out the, the best from both of them and provide those insights. And I think that from the examples we've given you, you've seen things associated with benchmarking, informing strategy, increasing efficiency through greater focus on what matters most and strengthening communications. Thank you. Good. Um, great. That was great. Thank you guys very much. Um, so we've been talking at you here for about an hour and 10 minutes and now's really your chance to either make observations or, or ask questions and can we open up the floor? You can, Jeremy. <laughs> Thank you. And Jeremy, your workshop is coming up next. Anything you want to preview for the crowd? Uh, we just want you all in here. This is clearly the room where it happened. Like the first few workshops <laughs> Excellent. I think I'm moving to London. Eileen.
I think this should this is so critical for um, folks like me to really understand what you do and how it impacts what we do. So thank you. Oh, thank you, Ellie. <laughs> All right, I leave. <laughs> Question, yes. Uh, do you employ client guys on staff or do you outsource it and just have them run the models? Us? Yeah. I mean, you're doing all the regression analysis, so they got to come up with all the coefficients and all that. Are you doing it yourself or are you outsourcing? I think, I mean, in terms of Ketchum specifically, we have about a half dozen people who are pretty good at quant, uh, including we've just hired three of them who are sort of out of a PhD kind of program in that area. Previously, though, we were um, and, and still continue to partner with a company called The Modelers, which is based in Salt Lake City. In fact, they were the ones, uh, if I recall correctly, who did um, some of the, the ConAgra example. And actually, I should have pointed out the ConAgra example is a shared client uh, with, with uh, Edelman as well. How, how do you guys, uh, Pauline, handle it, Edelman Berland? I think we've probably got more primary than secondary researchers worldwide because we're doing everything from focus groups, which I'm sure Ketchum does as well, um, surveys, online communities. So we've got quite a, an array of tools that we use for everything from message testing to corporate reputation um, within in-house. But then where we need specialized skills we don't have, we would then go outside of ourselves as well. So it's a real mixture. <laughs> and uh, at Prime, Prime is a, uh, a research service provider. And our origins are in academia. So there's a heavy emphasis on quantitative. And we have uh, a team that focuses on this kind of modeling and quantitative research. Thanks. I was just thinking, actually, about your question. The two hires that we just made it in our research group in the last week one is a PhD candidate at a University of Florida who's a quant jock, and the other one is an insight person. So we're actually, as I think about it, if, if I look at hiring for, for agencies, at least to catch them, and I think beyond, we're all hiring both right and left brain sided people simultaneously, I think, at this point, and sort of emphasizing both of those things in our research businesses, and also who our, our suppliers are in the same regard. Marion. I have a loud voice anyway, so I'll just go ahead. Wow. <laughs> Pauline, you yeah, um, put down a microphone. You don't. <laughs> I know, it could be a bit much. Pauline, thank you for your presentation. There was some fabulous stuff in there, and some great um, tools to use around reputation measurement. Where you have a scenario where, for your larger clients, they can afford a lot of different tools to use to measure reputation. Where you're in a mid-sized client and you're trying to encourage them to get into this as well, where do you start? What tools do you prioritize, recommend to your clients from the six or eight that you show are possible yeah. to do as being most valuable and most linked to business results? Okay. I think it often depends on finding out. I generally try and find out what already exists. So if they've got an insights group that is doing, I was talking with one client, uh, one Edelman client this last week, and I landed up having a meeting with their business insights group that already has a brand health tracker running. So it's how to partner with them on that. I think we don't want to reinvent the wheel. So I would have been proposing that. They've already got that. So in that instance, I'm looking very much at doing the secondary research, the media analysis that is going to be bringing the most back for them. I think often having some form of landscape analysis for starters, um, some media audit is a very good way of showing the, the lay of the land now and possibly even then a survey that you may get to repeat in a year's time to see how it's moved. But generally, I would start with a landscape analysis of this is what the media is. If they've got key stakeholders, I might recommend a reputation of some description survey, but potentially even limiting it. I mean, we all know that when we're looking at different stakeholders, some stakeholder groups can be very hard to get hold of. So you may be looking at doing some IDIs, some sorry, in-depth interviews, just qualitatively to a script rather than doing a formal survey. So that sort of thing. So may I build? Yes. So um, I, th I, th I think it's exciting to be in an environment like this, hearing presentations like this, where you're seeing really the state of the art. All of these clients, most of these clients, especially modeling clients, 
are investing a lot of money in research generally, and they have the ability to do so. Uh, in most of the public speaking I do, it's among audiences that are not so well equipped. And my advice to them is very simple. It's two steps, begin and continue. It's that simple. Start with something. And even if it's an imperfect measure, I think I'd rather be partially right than totally in the dark. So just get started with whatever simple and have it grow. And I think when people do that, it creates an appetite within the organization that then um, creates demand and brings with it the resources to do more. I hope that answers your question. And Dave, yes. you, you want to build on that? Well, I was thinking, you know, actually in talking with you, uh, what you were saying, Pauline, and Mark, what I thought you were going to build on was in terms of where to get started was around social listening in terms of the landscape. Mm -hmm. And since you touched on that a bit with MasterCard, you just want to touch on for a second about how you go about social listening, how people get started in that area? Well, social listening, and this group would know it better than almost any group, I think, is, um, is that a lot of the barriers to research and public relations disappear with social listening. Uh, and that has to do with budget and, uh, and getting started. And so since there are so many tools that are free and simple uh, and maybe even only partially right, uh, it's a way to get started. And I think that it, it, that's probably the most accessible. Uh, you know, it's things like simple quantitative measures like clip counting with traditional media, uh, f which can be f not expensive, social media, which can be free. Um, and even free survey tools like online survey tools that uh, at least eliminate that challenge. And Pauline has more. Yeah, we're just, just going to build on each other <laughs> all for the next 15 minutes. And thank just, you for the just, last question. Just, this is now going to go on. For just, just picking on that as well, that, I mean, Mark's talked about free tools. And there are some free tools, but there's no such thing as free because there has to take effort and time into it. And one of the things that I find is that for many clients, they think, oh, well, I'm not really spending very much. But if they were to quantify the amount of time they are spending, then that would look a very, very different equation. And that time is time that could be invested doing something else. So I just want to make that point as well, because I think it helps justify having, having a budget to do some form of research. And the other thing with listening is I find that by listening, it actually helps inform decision making and makes people smarter. And sometimes it frees up budget because it identifies things that need to happen within a company and you can actually start making a case for it. Paul Braun, one of our sponsors here. Thanks for being here, Paul. Uh, social listening skills, since it's relatively new, what are some of the more common mistakes that companies do in uh, getting started in social listening skills, and what are some of the things that you see uh, that people should be at least avoiding uh, to be counterproductive in that endeavor? Well, so I'm going to contradict what I said a moment ago. So <laughs> the way, I, the, because the way I interpreted the last question was, if you have no budget, how do you get started? If you have if you're at zero. I think one of the biggest mistakes that people can make is, is, uh, is, is becoming overly dependent on poor data. So social media uh, provides lots of accessible tools for listening, but I think people have to understand that, um, to, and I think it's part of Pauline's point too, that there may be a cost to, to some of those free tools. So, uh, you know, my, my company makes money providing those kinds of services. So, uh, you know, services that are, uh, like I was describing, hybrid uh, social media listing that has human involvement for validation, improved accuracy, and that sort of thing. And I think especially as we move into a time of big data, it's important to emphasize accuracy if you're bound to make important decisions based on the data. So that, that's what I would say, is just be, uh, it, I said earlier, it's, it's better to be half right than totally in the dark. I believe that, but when there comes a point when uh, we have to understand the limitations of the choices, the research choices that we make, and to be aware of those limitations as we evolve, that would be. Selling it gets good enough. 
Well, sometimes it can be a challenge. I'm going to use one dreaded word, taxonomy, as well, when it comes to listening, because that is actually getting smart search strings to weed out information you don't need, because it can be a nightmare, and you can get totally overwhelmed with data. So being able to get the data that matters to you, whilst not having a whole load of dross, is probably one of the biggest challenges for organizations, particularly as if, I mean, if you're going with a company that does it all the time, they're really smart about putting these taxonomies together. Whereas if you're trying to do it from scratch yourself and you haven't got that experience, you're going to find out the hard way continually over and over again to try and get to that point. You know, I'd say, Paul, just um, one perspective would be, which is sort of Mark alluded to, but I just felt the need to build on what he said, is um, that, you know, is overreaction. I think one of the biggest mistakes we tend to make with social listening is we decide everything is important. And the reality is if we don't really understand at its fundamental, who is our target audience, what makes them tick, what do they pay attention to, if we know that cold, it gives us a pretty good guidepost as to what to react to and frankly what not to react to. I, I sometimes see with clients, uh, you know, whether it's a YouTube video posted for FedEx where a delivery guy this last holiday season throws a TV over a fence. And they, you know, oh, my God, the world has ended. Well, the world didn't actually end. And the next little crisis that came along, which was fortunately, in their case, UPS, FedExes went away. So, you know, it, it is the reaction to it that becomes particularly important. If Jenny, I saw your hand up. Oh, yeah. Uh, thank you for your presentations. They are really brilliant. Dear Mark, uh, you showed us uh, the ratio, that the ratio between spending and revenue in PR is um, the most effective. So I would like to ask you, uh, what the best numbers you can get by uh, PR? I mean, uh, the global companies have to use uh, all uh, different sales channels. Uh, and what's the ceiling of PR in this mixed modeling? Okay, good question. So um, uh, the way I interpret that question is, uh, is there a point of diminishing return with public relations? Is that a fair way to say it? Is there a point at which PR stops improving? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So um, in every one of the studies in which I've been involved, I've been involved maybe 40 or 50 in categories like uh, consumer products, financial services, movies, um, telecommunications, automotive, and lots of others. And in, uh, in every one of those cases, public relations was the most efficient. Now, I showed you that it didn't deliver the most sales revenue. It was just the most efficient, to David's point, about a value. How much did we spend and what did we get in return? In, in, uh, so in all those cases, public relations was most efficient, and in no case have we seen a point of diminishing return. Whereas, uh, so in other words, if, if we double the PR budget, if we triple the PR budget, do we, see, do we see a plateau? And in no case have we seen it. I don't know, I know David and Pauline have also experiences in this area, but I've never seen a plateau. Uh, now, and let me just make a point, that in the budgets that we're talking about, the amount of spending, I told you public relations rounds down to zero. So increasing, so I'll put it this way, every, everybody involved in uh, mass market television advertising will tell you that they recognize that probably 8% of their spending is wasted. Either the commercial didn't run, it didn't appear at the right time, it got clipped, something happened. If you're spending in public relations one half of 1%, a 2% shift into public relations uh, quadruples the PR budget. So it's, it, it doesn't take much for public relations budgets to go up. Uh, I think there's a point at which it becomes very difficult through traditional media to place another story about mattresses or some other subject. But uh, we've seen no point of diminishing return. So I, I know you, you have a point to add to this? Yeah, but, but you know, uh, they do not put uh, all the budget in PR, right? Uh, True. But in, uh, but in if it's so effective, they should uh, just put all the money in PR and get uh, everybody. <laughs> Well, uh, every customer they want. It doesn't quite work that way. It's more to the point of what I was saying earlier that public relations acts as a buoy to elevate other forms of marketing. So when public relations is present at the other times, the performance of every other, the other nine and a nine and a half percent is improved. That's, I think, part of the mix too. Yeah, but I think, Evgeny, to your point, these market mix models are valid 
pretty much in the data ranges that you're looking at, in other words, where you have data for. So at the extreme, in other words, you don't have data at the extreme, and none of these models are linear. The reality is they're probably nonlinear, and to Mark's point, they slope off. I remember with the, Le the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society example I showed you, I presented those results to their board, and they said, okay, let's take all the money out of direct mail and put it all into online earned media. It would have been completely ineffective because we know, you know, they're currently spending $150,000 in online earned media just by basically, what would that be? Multiplying it by 20 is not going to give you 20 times the results. And so really what we try to urge clients in these models is make gradual shifts and then see how things are changing because you will get to a point of diminishing returns. But a real, if you will, fallacy in the models is that they predict beyond the ranges of the data for, or the ranges for which you have data. If you've been observing PR spend fluctuate between, let's say, $100 and $200, and you can understand what happens in that $100 to $200 range, that doesn't mean you understand what happens when it gets to $1,000. And that's the real trick to those models. Tony, you had an observation? But make a, an observation like the British language that would, you know. <laughs> why don't clients spend more on PR is the, the basic question. Why they, do they continue to spend? I, I understand that the things will plateau off, but we seem to be a long way from reaching a plateau. But I'd have thought it would be the, you'd expect to see a, a sort of a, a better balance on the different channels. And I, I don't see it happen. I'm, I'm sure you're going to say that's because PR agencies don't spend enough on actually evaluating their own results. I, and I was going <laughs> to say, I think that in relation to that, PR has done a very bad job of PRing itself within organizations. Um, I think advertising historically has done a very good job of that, which is why they get a lot of those budgets. The other thing I think we have to think about, just to go back to the earlier point, is we have to think about within PR what is newsworthy. So if you've got a new product, then they, you've got a great story, hopefully, because it's hopefully a good product. If it is a modification to an existing product, that is going to be a much harder story to sell into the media, and maybe advertising is a better tool to actually talk about that. So you do need to think about what it is you're needing to say and get across, and therefore what is the, most, the best channel to actually be able to communicate it. No, I, quick, I, quick. I, I do agree with that. I mean, we work for Procter & Gamble, for example. It's not the same doing PR for them for a detergent where there's mm -hmm. absolutely no news and nothing's happened mm -hmm. than it is launching a new fragrance or a new shampoo. But so. let me, and let me build on what you're saying because I, I would uh, suggest to you that public relations spending is growing and it's growing much uh, more dramatically than spending is in other categories. We may not always feel it, but in the U.S., the big holding companies uh, I think four out of five are reporting low double-digit growth in the public relations area within their agency holdings. And also there's a, there's a study that um, is conducted by an investment firm called Veronis Schuler in the U.S. that looks at communication spending globally, and it also does a five-year forecast. And in that forecast, public relations currently is shown as relatively low in spending. Uh, five years ago, it was still very low, but relatively speaking, the amount of spending that they forecasted for public relations was the second greatest leap in investment spending over the course of the five years. So I think it's, it's much more optimistic about uh, spending in public relations. As we continue to prove its value, you'll see even more. And, and actually, build it, building on that, if I might make just one more comment, is You know, that you do have your own workshop later. I know. Yeah, you <laughs> can make it. <laughs> Go ahead, Tony. I'm sorry. No, uh, the experience from uh, things like the Cannes, uh, the Cannes Awards and, and various other uh, marketing awards that we've been involved in is that a lot of what is considered advertising because it's done by advertising agencies is, is actually, we call it PR. Uh, so they are uh, doing increasingly uh, more work that we would classify as PR, but is probably classified as advertising as it's done by an ad agency. Maybe it's because it's where the money is. Particularly true for digital now. Yeah. So I saw three hands go up, and we have about five minutes left. So let's start with Eileen, go to Richard, and come to Marion, okay? Thank you. Thanks. I'll just make a quick comment, because um, in my organization, one of the top and largest hospitals in the U.S., um, we used to survey 
where client or where our customers heard about the Cleveland Clinic and it was on television. Well, our marketing staff took credit for advertising on television even in a time when we weren't advertising. So I hired my own analyst because I didn't know what I was doing. We talk about not doing our own PR in-house very well. But what we did is we looked at the questions on the survey and then when it said was it in television, was it advertising or was it a news program? And the numbers just totally swapped from, you know, the news program went way up here and the advertising went way down here. So that completely changed the makeup of our organization. We went from four PR people for a company that has 42,000 employees to now 40. So our CEO recognized the value based on what you all do and that was just changed our organization completely. And then we hired David. <laughs> That's everybody's answer. <laughs> Let's actually, uh, to make it easy for the young lady with the microphone, can you stop here before you get to Richard, to this young lady over here, and we'll come across to Richard, then to Mary. Stop, or, no, back up. Thank you, gracias. Hello. I do think that uh, you provide a lot of value to organizations, but I see a little bit of, of a problem also. It's that sometimes that knowledge uh, doesn't stay in the company and, and the company ends up being a bit dependent on you. So I think that maybe sometimes it would be great that uh, you involve maybe people in the organization so that they can uh, work directly with you. I don't know, maybe you do it already and, I'm, and, and so, so that they can learn from you and then develop, maybe, maybe not develop the models from the beginning, but nourish them and develop them by themselves so that um, so that all this is seen as an investment no and not maybe as a constant expenditure i well, don't know maybe you do it already well, and I'm I, thinking. I would recommend i would suggest to you and i think anybody in this room who's a service provider would agree that a, a smart and curious informed client is our greatest asset so it's in our interest to have clients who understand what we do and who understand it well enough to apply what we do uh, on behalf of the business. And I think to that end, really, if we think of the purpose of this summit, how do we unlock business performance through communications using the tools we've all been talking about for the last little bit? A big part of it, I think we're going to come out on Friday, is about how do we create the informed client base? I mean, that, that is the fundamental core. Let's go to Richard, then Marion, and then just take a closing comment from each of you, if you'd like. Thanks, David. Um, Richard Hout, I'm a PR man by trade, or have been for the last 25 years. Um, I've got some thoughts on why it's not growing. Um, well, it is growing, I think. Um, but the industry has been slow to grab the opportunities that social media um, has brought the PR sector, having been to three, four AMEC conferences now, summits. I know you guys are battling with the uh, social media side of things as well. So I think that's one of it. Reality is, margins in PR consultancies are tight. They don't want to give third party suppliers of evaluation services their fee. Let's be absolutely honest about it, if they can avoid it. Um, and that may be combined with something that often gets me in trouble when I say this, that I'm not entirely sure that every in-house corporate comms director and every communications consultant believes PR works. They quite like a little bit of greyness. Let's be absolutely honest about it. Because really, if you look at it logically, there's no reason why every PR campaign wouldn't be evaluated somehow. It doesn't, doesn't make any sense to me. Um, but overall, I would think that you're going to see more money from... PR companies, because the two things they do really well is they're very good at creating conversations, and they do that by creating content, and that's what the digital and social world really needs. So I think the future is bright. I just think probably it'll take a bit of time for the new generation to get the get control of it. Marion, and being in an integrated agency, Ogilvy, we see this every day from the inside. So we are seeing increasingly um, advertising people coming to knock on PR's door to say, "Our client wants to know more about." help us create something around the reputation scene mm -hmm. as part of our advertising stuff. So the numbers don't fully tell the story. And Mark, you referred to, you know, numbers showing shifts and where it's growing. And, and I think you touched on it over here also, is a lot of what's happening within advertising and digital is p what we would call PR that we are seeing day by day. And I think the big game changer for us, and Richard, you touched on it also, is content. Is the agencies within Ogilvy, within all our different disciplines, is all working out where this content thing come from, right? What, what should we all be doing about this and how does it cross over? It is such a game-changing opportunity for PR 
that it, we need to seize it very quickly because it's all about reputation and engagement and we do it far better than other disciplines as well. So I think it's my, kind of my warning for the future, what's coming is its content is the space really to watch. Mm -hmm. And the reason most um, PR people don't want to evaluate their communications is they're terrified of numbers because <laughs> <laughs> I try to teach them. <laughs> yeah. Any closing comments, Pauline? Yes, I just think that um, I'm going, going to go a bit against the flow of what we've just been talking about in that I do actually see budgets growing. I think that they are loosening up a bit more now than they were a, a couple of years ago. And I am finding a real hunger for smart measurement and metrics that are going to particularly resonate with the C-suite and more senior people. So I think that one of the things we have to do is make sure we change our language to be more understandable so that we're not just talking about things in our own little bubble, but that we're actually being able to go across company and have people understand what we're talking about. And I do find that we need to also be more holistic so we can't just be blinkered into our world of counting clips or whatever that means. Digital is a huge opportunity um, to build on content. I would say it's, the, it's now a video very much at the moment and how we measure that. And it's looking at the amplification of the messages. So it's not just getting the content out, it's amplifying it and seeing where it goes, what it does, and how in, what the engagement factor is associated with that content. Um, and I think that we can get carried away with this really worked, this is great, but we are in danger of getting away from what is important to the brand. And so we have to keep going back to the business objectives. Um, I don't know if you remember years ago, there was, um, you know, there's various initiatives that have happened online and people think that's a great initiative, but they've not a clue what the brand was behind it. Mm -hmm. And so it's really important that we keep focused on our brand and our business objectives. Thank you. A quick closing remark is that I th wasn't. it was longer. Than <laughs> Might be. So, uh, a quick response is. Um, <laughs> you're right. Okay. Yeah, you're right. just getting so my uh, quick response now. is that as as communications research of a type practiced by AMEC members uh, elevates the business, it contributes to, and elevates the business, not just the public relations departments or corporate communications groups, as it elevates the business. Uh, it can't help but elevate our, our our businesses. And I see that happening more and more in our targeting. We don't just target corporate communicators anymore. We're, we're targeting business decision makers and we're contributing to the overall success of the business. It's, and it's a much more interesting place to be, I have to tell you. I love corporate communications, but it's interesting to see our work manifest itself in a new product or in a company, um, you know, a company making a big business decision based on our data. Thanks. Great. Thank you. So next is a break. Uh, we're going to thank a couple people first. There are hostesses to help guide you to where the break is. And then the next workshop that Jeremy is putting on in this room will start at 1130. Thanks again to Trendiction for the sponsorship of this workshop day. And Mark and Pauline, thanks very much. <laughs>